Hey everyone, um, welcome. It's the first official blog of InTheWolvesDen.net video blog here. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of both. Uh, my wife and I have just moved uh, a couple of months ago into our apartment and uh, I've got my office now a little bit neater. Um, if you've seen some of the earlier videos which uh, were kind of updates of what was going on, um, you know, uh, I've been straightening stuff out. I got all my books here now. Um, not every one of them, as you can see over here, are put away, but you know, it's enough, enough there to um, kind of set us into being. Well, let me just jump in and, and tell you what uh, what the blog here is is for. Well, um, I'm currently one of the pastors at a church here in uh, Taunton, Massachusetts, and um, you know I, I get to preach from time to time. But um, I've preached not quite two dozen times, and uh, just over a dozen times. Um, and they say that a pastor to find his voice is uh, has to preach 200 times. Well. Uh, I'm trying to find that voice. I want to, I'm, I'm my own worst critic. Um, I know my messages get to the point, and I know people enjoy them, but, um, you know, you're always going to be your own worst critic. So, uh, this is a little bit to help me, and uh, a little bit to help you, mostly. Um, because one thing, I, I do have a gift of teaching, and um, uh, I want to be able to teach people. Uh, I want to be able to become more comfortable in speaking, and expressing my voice and uh, you know sometimes I, I, I sit there and I watch I, I listen to, to the videos and I'm like Ugh. but um, anyway um, last week I was I was having coffee with a friend of mine and what ended up happening through that that discussion uh, came an idea for this actual video blog and um, what it was was I have a, I have a friend I actually have a few friends um, I actually had a discussion with a friend on Facebook uh, that was similar, but sitting down with coffee uh, with another friend, uh, we got to talking yeah, about um, preaching or teaching. You know, we, we both agreed on discipleship, but um, what is part of discipleship? Is it the preaching or the teaching? And um, I do believe it's a, it's a little bit of both. I believe that the Bible teaches us that we have to have a healthy balance of both. Well, how does that work? How how do we have a healthy balance of both to, you know, share the gospel and help uh, disciple new Christians while helping older Christians mature even more in their faith? Well, um, this, this discussion got to being, and uh, one, my friend uh, sat there and said, you know, um, I'm almost to a point, he tells me, where he's like, I'm ready to not go to church on Sundays because I think the preaching is not good enough. Um, it's not hitting me. It's not making me think. Um, you know, and just go to community group. And he cited uh, Hebrews as, as part of it. And I said, well, let's look at Hebrews. So um, took out my Bible and... We turn to Hebrews, and, and uh, probably should have had this set up, but eh, it's right there. It's uh, highlighted for me. Um, it was Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, and um, this is this is really uh, the crux of of where we were at. Now, the writer of Hebrews, just so you know, Hebrews does not have an assigned writer. Most of the Bible, most of the Bible, we know who the writer is. Hebrews is about the only verse, the only uh, book in the Bible. We don't have an idea. Uh, well, we don't know. Some people think it might have been Apollos. Uh, others think it might have been Timothy or maybe even Titus who wrote this because there's word, word language in here that tells us that this is written by a second generation Christian. Um, it was actually argued during uh, making of the canon of the Bible whether or not Hebrew should go in there, but it's got a lot of good, um, a lot of good stuff to say that we cannot take this out of the Bible, and that's that's what um, the council uh, decided that 
you know, came up with the canon. Well, anyway, jumping back in to um, Hebrews here, this is what the writer of Hebrews tells us. He says, let us, so that's the church, that's, that's the Christians, that's the faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Okay, the hope is the gospel. All right. For he who promised is faithful, that's Christ, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say here is that there is a reason for the meeting. It's, it's to stir one another on. It's to remind people of what the gospel says. It's to remind us what we're supposed to be doing. It's to be going ahead and, and you know, loving one another, doing good works for, for the gospel. So what are those good works? It might be uh, going to a homeless shelter and helping out there, feeding the hungry. Um, it might be other other things that you know the churches aren't all hodgepodge you know one church might have a good hand at helping people in the community for this reason uh, which might be the homeless this church might have a hand in orphanage you know just different things but um, it's wherever the God the heart of that church is that God is, has set up, you know, where the gifting is, what really speaks to those people's soul. So does this verse mean a community group or a church? Well, community groups, uh, small groups can do things. Uh, I've seen it. We've, we've actually at my church tried to inspire people to go ahead and do that, to uh, go out into the community and help people uh, as, as that community group. But we also know that churches can pull the sources together and do greater things, whether it's starting a food kitchen or a food pantry or uh, something to help the needy, uh, clothing drives. You know, there's just these things that can come together when you have more hands and more resources to do that. Well, um, he wasn't convinced. He wasn't totally convinced. He was like, you know... Um, Jesus never preached. That was basically what he said. So I said, well, you know, let's look at the most famous sermon we have here, okay? Um, and we look, we turn to Matthew 5, and, you know, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what is a sermon? A sermon is usually done by a pastor. It's usually done by somebody, and we'll call it the message. You know, nowadays we'll say, you know, uh, he's bringing the message. Um, in olden days, it was uh, the sermon. You know, this this week's sermon. Uh, but all together, it's usually preaching. That's what we say, preaching. Well, well let's look here. Um, Jesus in verse one, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Okay, well, what is he doing? Is he teaching the disciples? Is he teaching the people? That's the question. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, you know, they're, they're some of the most quoted verses of the Bible. But did he preach? You know, if we look at that wording where it says he's seeing the crowds and he sat down and the apostles came to him and he opened his mouth and he began to teach. Is that Jesus teaching the apostles or is he teaching the crowd? Okay. And so most people will take it that he's teaching the crowd. And we have another ver another version of this or another um, kind of parallel which is the Sermon on the Plain in Luke where he's speaking to crowds and uh, you know teaching. Um, so is it teaching or preaching? Well it's not quite clear if you just look at it that way but again I would argue that we need to look at it that it's a fair balance. Think about it uh, how many times Jesus gave a parable 
to the apostles or to the crowds and then he would pull the apostles aside and give them a little bit more about that. That's what I think preaching, teaching, uh, discipleship is all about is the pastor preaches the sermon. In this case Jesus gives the parable of the sower and the seeds and he gives it to the crowd and the crowd's a little perplexed and then he pulls the apostles aside and he tells them further he says you know this is what the seeds meant this is the gospel this is you know the ground is those who receive it and he goes in a little bit deeper on what the meaning of the parable was so that's what i think it really community groups and and um you know, going to church and pre being preached to is, is that you're going to go to a church and hear a sermon, and depending on your church, if your church does sermon-based community groups, which is usually where you talk about um, the sermon that the pastor spoke on Sunday, you're going to go a little bit more deeper into it and, and um, teach them and bring out more of the things that you just didn't have time to uh, during the hour that the pastor was preaching. Well, my buddy still wasn't convinced. He still wasn't convinced. And so I said, well, you know, let's look at Paul. Now, Paul is a different different character. Paul, um, he was the apostle that uh, basically, basically, he was a rabbi. You know, he was part of the um, <coughs> Pharisees. He um, he was able to be uh, uh, under the tutelage, under the discipleship of a, a good rabbi. And uh, during that time, he was able to um, help bring the gospel uh, to the people. Sorry, I had to pause things there. Um, had to get myself some water. Throat was uh, starting to get a little dry and something I, I should know about myself from preaching is that I tend to need a cup of water every now and then. So anyway, Paul, uh, he was he was the student of a rabbi. He, he was a Pharisee. He had an idea of what uh, what was taught. He learned under the tutelage of a, of a rabbi. In uh, that time, what that meant was like living with a rabbi. You you woke up when they woke up, had dinner when they ate, breakfast when they ate, studied when they studied, and you would learn. And uh, part of part of their whole philosophy, even today now, is uh, they will always quote, uh, you know, well, rabbi so-and-so. Like if there's some kind of argument, um, they will sit there and they will bring back and say, rabbi, you know, Stimist said this about, um, you know, whatever. So, um, Paul is, is one of those men that, you know, just really can, um, you know, knows what it's like to, to have, you know, to be a disciple and to disciple. He had Priscilla and Aquila, he had Apollos, Timothy and Titus, his most famous two. Um, but we need to, to turn to 1 Timothy 2 and... Um, you know, look at what his words are. How did Paul see himself? Well, Paul sits here and he says, uh, now this is 1 Timothy 2 um, and verse 7. He says, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. So, there we have it. He's, he's kind of put in both of them. He's a preacher and a teacher. You know, and that's a good balance. Um, he, even, he even uses it again. He'll, he'll use it again in 2 Timothy. He'll sit there and 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. So this is not 1 Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. He says... Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So he's telling you, you know, he preaches the gospel. He's he's telling people, you know, uh, teaching them his gospel, which is is the, our gospel, you know. But it's it's central to the gospel. We always say, you know, what is your gospel? And it's true. There are churches that will have different 
different Gospels, um, but it should be all grounded in here in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> so that's what he's doing. He's um, a preacher and a teacher. And we see that when he's writing to the church in Ephesus. Um, he tells them, you know, uh, he, he's talking about the spiritual gifts and what those spiritual gifts are good for. Um, so we look in Ephesians 4, um, <clears throat> verse 10, and uh, we're going to go to verse 16 on this. Now, this is this is an important thing because um, he's trying to tell the church in Ephesus what you know, you're, you're, you're changed what your life in Christ should be. Um, this is how Christ changes you. This is how the church helps you grow in your faith. So this is what he says. He who descended is the one who has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So that's Christ. Again, this is Jesus that he's talking about. Now he's talking about the spiritual gifts. All right. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Now, one thing to look at, if you've got your Bible, and I'm using the English Standard Version here. But if you look at the Bible, um, and you look at this passage, verse 11, when he's saying the apostles, comma, the prophets, comma, the evangelists, comma, the pastors and teachers, comma. It's not pastors, comma, and teachers, period, he's saying the pastors and teachers, comma. So what he's trying to say is that this is uh, one and the same, that pastors teach. Pastors have that gift of teaching, that they are blessed. Uh, we also have people who might not even think of themselves as preachers. Uh, I know um, our old church, the elders were not, you know, they, they hadn't been ordained as a pastor. They weren't reverend so and so, um, most of them were never in Bible school. They were all uh, well discipled by either the pastors or um, you know the Holy Spirit. You know they took their Bibles and they studied the Scriptures and, and poured over it, and the Spirit just really gave them a lot of knowledge. And those people, and I mean, I have I have uh, family and friends who have been called into eldership, and they have this gift of teaching and preaching. <clears throat> and that's that's key. This is what we have to understand is, um, is there a balance? Well, yeah, there is a balance. Well, how do we know? Well, we know it because right here, Paul, in the scriptures, is when he's listing these gifts, these, these people, uh, these overseers, okay, he's saying apostles, prophets, evangelists. Then he's putting pastors and teachers together, okay? Now, you can have people that can teach and maybe not preach, and that's fine. That's, that's, that's fine. There are people that are comfortable who will teach the gospel and uh, not be comfortable to go up in front of the crowds. You know, it does get uh, a little nerve, you know, unnerving. Um, I know uh, in in the time that I've preached, uh, the many times that I've preached now, um, well, not so many as I said, but in, in those times that I've preached, uh, I've preached to crowds as small as 50, and I've preached to crowds as big as 300. And you know there is there is uh, a difference. Um, you tend to to think about it a little bit. Uh, I have a, a dear friend who I I, I serve with um, at my church, and you know they they have that thing where they kind of get a little bit nerved when they get up there and preach. And um, you can understand it when you, when you come across verses that say you know those who you know seek to be teachers will be judged more harshly than others, but. <clears throat> You know, for for the part of, of this discussion that we're talking about, about preaching and teaching, I say there's a balance, and I think that's that's the perfect balance right there. Is he gives us pastors and teachers? Now, what is this? What are the apostles and prophets and evangelists and preachers and teachers, pastors and teachers, uh, done? Well, they are to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may not 
that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro from the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Well, there you go. We're talking making people mature. We're talking about giving people ministry. What is that ministry? That ministry can be anything within the church that they feel their gifting is equipped for. Like when you sit there and you have disciples and they're sitting there saying, well, this is my gift. Okay. There are ways to tell if that person has that gift. If a person has a gift of mercy, you know that their hearts are going to go out to people who are suffering. They're going to understand when somebody has had a loss, they, they are able to sit there and cry with them and, and also encourage them, which is another spiritual gift and help them bring them back uh, be Christ the arms and feet of Christ and, and just uh, be there for them and help them through that time uh, if a person says that they have a gift of teaching they're going to be able to sit there and expo, expo, uh, excuse me my words are but they're gonna sit here and um, be able to exposit the Bible and uh, bring out what these words are, are meaning and that's what we get uh, what he is saying here is um, when we're doing this and we're building up the body of Christ that's that's the church okay we're, we're you have to understand most people think the church is a building it's not a building corporately it's a building but to the Christian it's the people all right me and my wife the people in our community group and those then that are in that call our church their church all right it's not the building that we meet in but it's the body of believers who are the church so you can destroy the church building but you're not going to destroy the church that's the one thing Satan has been trying to do for over 2,000 years now he sits here and he says until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. All right. And then he goes into to the deceitfulness, uh, the human cunning, and every wind of doctrine. Now, that's the thing is when people come to Christ, you know, they, they hear, uh, well, you know, this person teaches this. Now, I am, I am a, a huge opponent of uh, the word of faith movement. I do not believe in it. I think it's the most harmful thing out there. Um, they sit there and they, they um, try to tell us that, uh, you know, if you want that Mercedes, uh, if you want that house, go ahead and buy it. Even though you don't have the money to, God is going to provide a way. Now, I believe God is going to provide, okay? I believe in the Lord's Prayer. But the one thing about the Lord's Prayer when he says, uh, give us this day our daily bread. He's not talking about, you know, give us $5 million to live and, and to be uh, uh, a part of something right here and now. He's talking about, um, you know, today, right now. Uh, today is Tuesday when I'm giving this. So when I got up and I thanked God for the day, I knew that God was going to, and I, I thanked him ahead of time that, he was going to meet for my needs today, and sure enough, he did. You know, there were things that happened today that I didn't expect, and those were met. Why? Because God knew that. He's giving me my daily bread to meet those needs. And that's what it means. Being a Christian is, doesn't mean that you're going to be rich. Being a Christian uh, doesn't mean that you're going to have um, all rainbows and fluffy cotton candy clouds. Um, there are Christians that suffer for the gospel. There are brothers and sisters in China right now who have to meet in secret because the government will put them to death or put them in prison for a long time. Uh, same thing in the Middle East. There are many countries where Christians, in fact, 
Uh, we just recently, within the last couple of months, uh, we we're battling ISIS over in the Middle East, and they put to death 21 Coptic Christians for their faith. This is what happens. God, you know, God will use rich people. That's that's the one thing this this tells you. If you read the book of Acts, it tells you that, you know, God doesn't mind riches. It, it, money is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil. God will use those people that have the riches to be able to provide for whatever gospel-bearing thing, whatever is going to be fruitful and give him glory, he's going to do. But that's the thing, you know, God wants us to learn about the doctrines. What does that mean? So Word of Faith is one of those doctrines that really messes people up and uh, people think that uh, one person is not a Christian because they're not spirit-filled. Um, others, because they think that they're not a Christian because, uh, you know, I'm using an ESV and it's not a King James Bible. This is is the sticky situation. Now, I love them. I have family and friends that, you know, follow those ways. But, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where it can fall into, into the crack of legalism, which is something that, uh, that's why in the temple you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Inseas. Um, zealots, you know, these were, these were four, if you wanted to call it, denominations within the temple that had arisen because of different ways that they interpret scripture. Thing is, if you are a Christian and you believe this to be absolutely infallible, um, you know, you're going to be a Christian. Um, so I do believe that so, that those people are Christians, but their doctrines they need to study a little bit more. They got to crack into the Bible and really read what the Bible says, and, and thus far they will mature and um, just you know grow into the body and help the body grow. And and you know. That's what we need to do as a church. We need to be lifting one another up. If we hear that somebody is um, following something that they shouldn't, or um, really questioning things, help them out. You know, be able. You know, know this book well enough that you can sit there and open it up, and just uh, be able to uh, present the gospel. Second Timothy two fifteen, which is. My life verse is uh, study to show yourself a workman who needs not to be ashamed, who rightly divides the word of truth. Um, and that's what you need to be. You need to, to be able to take this Bible and teach somebody, well, what are you doing? You're discipling. You're teaching and discipling. And that's where this whole point of, uh, of that part goes. Now, <clears throat> Paul does give Timothy hand in hand um, that preaching and teaching go hand in hand. So let's go to um, 2 Timothy 4. Verse 1. All right. This is, uh, this is a famous verse. You know, you probably have heard this before uh, in church or, or on radio or TV. This is what Paul tells Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, uh, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teaching and teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As you always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So right there, Paul is warning Timothy and he's warning us that um, there are going to be doctrines that we, we need to know our, our faults, that we have doctrines that um, are solid 
and those solid doctrines are going to fight back these false doctrines. Now the sad thing is within the church, and this is what my friend tried to bring up, was that um, these doctrines, the, these things, are always argued about, sadly. Um, and that's what leads to church splits. That's what leads to, you know, six different Baptist denominations or several, I don't know, you know, uh, different Pentecostal traditions, different Presbyterian, different Anglican, Episcopal, you know, all these different um, denominations which still claim, you know, one of the names, well, you know, like the two back in the 1800s were Methodist and Baptist, and yet there are multiple uh, Methodist denominations and spin-off denominations and multiple Baptist and spin-off denominations. And that's what the sad part is, is that there are these different denominations because people will argue, and, and I don't have this verse ready, but there is a verse in Colossians, I believe, where um, Colossians or Galatians, where uh, Paul is warning about um, philosophies and, and ideologies that uh, come from man that split the body even further. Um, but that's the sad thing. And, and so this is what Paul sits there and he's telling Timothy, this is, this is important. So this is the importance of your ministry. If you're a pastor, you have a ministry. If you are uh, a Sunday school teacher, you have a ministry. If you're in the men's ministry, that's your ministry. If you work uh, with the ladies' ministry, that's your ministry. The kids, you know, these different things. Youth group, you have these ministries that you're in charge of. Paul's sitting there saying, know your doctrine. Well, how do you know that doctrine? Again, it goes back. Pastors, there to be teaching you. Even pastors have mentors. Pastors usually have older pastors that can walk alongside them and mentor them, help them through struggles, and get them to that point where um, they might not have it all. You know, you're never going to have it all. You're not going to have it all this side of heaven. You'll have it all on the other side. But <clears throat> this is what this is what. You know, Paul's trying to tell Timothy. And this is what Paul tells us again back in Ephesians. You know, that's how we get that maturity. We get the maturity because we're going to church, we're learning, we're eating, we're in a community group, we're helping ourselves grow, we're becoming disciples. Um, one thing that has really been, really been getting to me uh, that I, I need to do and, and really need to figure out how to do it is um, take a couple of men and... Uh, have coffee with them from my church and really disciple them a little bit more um, and, and get closer to them and, and you know just talk with them so you know that's that's part of that um, but ultimately you know my friend asked me well is discipleship real is that what's called for in the church and I look to him, and this is this is actually uh, pretty much our verse for it. Um, our verse at the church I serve, and uh, the the verse for all churches. Um, it's in Matthew twenty-eight, verses eighteen to twenty. And this is Jesus' final command to the to the apostles as he's going up to heaven. It's what we call the Great Commission. And Jesus said. To them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. And now I think this is an interesting verse because I have people who tell me, well, you know, um, the church should be focused on what's going on locally. They shouldn't worry about world missions. And this verse, this this passage, um, definitely says no, because it says make disciples of all nations. Well, how do we do that? We have to send people uh, out to do that. We have to send people to go ahead and and speak God's word, God's love, the gospel to those nations. And and believe me, I have a friend who. 
He's he's uh, just over 30, just turned 31, and he has gone on more missions, uh, more missions trips than I know most people have in their lifetime who are who are older, who are in their 50s or 60s, and have been Christians pretty much their whole life. He he just. He doesn't know if he's called to be a missionary, but he just does this. He, he goes out. He's gone to Guatemala, Haiti, uh, Mexico, uh, even here in in America to other parts, and just shared the gospel love and, and the message to those people in different ways. But the key thing is, it says make disciples, make disciples. Well, how do you make them? Well, first you baptize them. Well. Some people wonder uh, if baptizing a person right after conversion is 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 all right, and I think you have to look at uh, Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts, and uh, the Ethiopian is reading Isaiah, and he's trying to figure that out, and Philip, through the Holy Spirit, uh, goes to this guy and explains it to them, and the Ethiopian believes, and then he says, "Can I be baptized? You know, there's a river right there," and they go and baptize him. So, yes, you know, baptizing, and then what? You teach them. You teach them everything that Jesus has commanded, and that's what we have here. We have it here in the Bible. Um, and that's what we do. We teach them all, everything that this says, and how to do it, and, and we live it. We have to live it. One thing, one thing that happens is we don't always live like we should. We don't always live like a Christian should. We're, we're Christians on Sundays, but we're something else. We're, 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 you know, deists or theists or I don't know what to call it. But uh, a lot of people, that's how they live um, Monday through Saturday. And then they get back into church and they're, they're back to it. You know, they're not sitting there having Bible time, devotional time, reading this. So, you know, what do you do? What do you do for becoming a disciple well first off um, you have to accept Christ you have to you have to uh, have Christ as your Lord and Savior you have to um, find a good Bible believing church you know if you don't know of one if you're if you're not a uh, Christian or if you're sitting there saying I don't know if the church I'm, I'm part of you know message me uh, on on YouTube um, and I'll get back to you, talk to you. Um, I'll look up, uh, tell me where where you are, and I'll look up and, and try to find a good church for you. Um, but that's the thing: you have to find a church that's that's Bible believing and preaching. Um, that's one thing you you don't want to get into a church. Um, there are churches that teach what Buddha or Confucius said, and that's not what the gospel is. Those were men. Jesus was the man God. He was God incarnate. He was the Son of God who died. He lived a life that we could not live, suffered, was died, buried, rose again so that we could be with the Father in heaven. So that's, that's what you need. You need to find a church. And then from that, um, get involved in that church's ministry. Churches have different ways of discipling. Uh, my church does it through community groups. Uh, another church I know does it, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one discipleship. They they have mature Christians that uh, they'll match up with you and, and disciple. Others might do it through the men's and women's and youth and children's ministries. But there are different ways that the church will disciple. And one thing to do is is find a a Barnabas. There's there's an old saying within uh, church circles and. Um, it's kind of like one that I, I think I've probably overused with some people, but it's one I, I really still think is very true. Paul had um, had three types of people in his life. He had a, a Barnabas, a Silas, and a Timothy. And the Barnabas is that older Christian that's going to help you to mature to your faith better. Um, the Silas is going to be your equal. It's going to be somebody who is on that same plane, and as you two journey, um, you'll be what we find in, in uh, Proverbs 27 about iron, iron, iron sharpening iron. Um, 
and that's that's what happens there and then the Timothy once you once you start to mature once you're getting it once you're understanding it pass on what you have learned as Paul commanded Timothy pass on what you have learned um, and that's it that's what you need to do so um, uh, this this is a really long um, uh, message lesson um, but uh, I hope you I hope you've uh, gotten something out of it. Uh, I pray that um, the Lord will um, bless you from it, and uh, that if you like this, um, you know, subscribe to this channel. If not, that's okay. You know, you'll probably uh, see it in your recommended list when we have new videos. So. Um, for all that you have, I, I pray and ask that the Lord bless you and keep you and uh, make his face shine upon you. Have a good day.